Shouts of wire down, box full, and weigh him up filled in the Willamette Valley during hop harvest. To anyone who has worked in the hop fields, the cries are a nostalgic reminder. What part did hop agriculture play in the lives of Willamette Valley residents? Why did the industry decline? During the next half hour, we will recall and explore the history of hop agriculture in the central Willamette Valley. The hop plant is a twining perennial that produces small cone-like blossoms. Inside the mature hop cone is a yellow powder called lupulin. The lupulin contains the resins and oils for which hops are valued. Hops have been used as a vegetable, in bread, and as a medicine for many centuries. Today, hops are used almost exclusively in the brewing of beer and ales. The custom of adding hops to beer began about the 14th century. Hops retarded spoilage and added a slightly bitter taste as well as a distinctive aroma. Changes in the flavor of beer produced by hops were not always appreciated. In 16th century England, Henry VIII prohibited the use of hops in beer. It was only over the span of many years that hop production became an important business in England and elsewhere, and the taste of hops became firmly associated with beer. It is believed that hops were among the plants that pilgrims brought with them to North America in 1620. By 1800, hops were grown in a number of states, and New York became the center of U.S. hop production. As the nation expanded westward, so did the hop, and gradually the areas along the Pacific coast replaced New York as the major producers of American hops. It was common for many settlers' homes to have a hop vine growing near at hand to supply medicinal, bread-making, and home-brewing needs. The census of 1850 lists eight pounds of hops grown in the Oregon Territory. From that modest beginning, Oregon hop production grew steadily until Prohibition days, and for many decades the state was the leading U.S. hop producer. The rich soil and mild climate of the Willamette Valley made it well suited to the growing of hops. Hop culture began with the clearing of land and the working of soil in preparation for planting rootstock. Stakes were set out in a uniform pattern of rows. One or two cuttings were planted at each stake site and referred to as a hill. In the early days of the industry, poles about 10 feet tall, such as those in the background of this photograph, were set into the ground at each hill. About the turn of the century, some growers began using a post and wire system. Posts were set at every third or fourth hill, and wire, or twine, was strung from one post to another. String was then run between the stake at each hill and the overhead wire. The best of the young vines were trained to twine around the pole, or string, in a clockwise direction. Tall sleds, pulled by horses or tractors, enabled workers to reach the overhead wires and train the vines along them for maximum exposure to air and sunlight. Rosa Cole of Salem remembers training the vines. And by that time, we um, they had a high sled. And uh, my sister and I used to train on here. And we used to play games and sing songs and everything. While, as we drove along, we had this old horse. 
and she would pull this high sled while we trained. When we wanted her to go, we told her to go, and when she stopped, we told her to go. Mixtures of nicotine, or quasi-chips, in whale oil soap were effective pesticides used to control red spider mites and aphids. Harvest began sometime in August or early September, depending upon the variety of hop grown. Many farmers grew small acreages of hops that could be harvested by family members alone. Somewhat larger acreages required the help of near neighbors who would lend a hand at this critical time. But for many growers, harvest time meant hiring several hundred pickers to assist with the work. In major hop producing areas, the size and number of hop branches meant the influx of thousands of workers every harvest season. For example, Independence, known as the hop capital of the world, was a quiet town during most of the year. Harvest season, however, brought huge crowds, as many as 25,000 workers, most of whom arrived by train. Pickers were met at the depot by growers, who took them and their baggage to the hop ranches by wagon. Some arrived by steamboats, such as the Oregona. Still others arrived in their own wagons, on horseback or on foot. Many workers returned year after year, brought their families and personal belongings, and stayed the whole season. In later years, they came by auto, bicycle, and bus. For most, hop harvest was a pleasant way to earn money for school and household expenses during the vacation. Rosa Cole, pictured here on the left, tells in a nutshell why she enjoyed harvest season. No, I liked hops. I liked work. I liked my paycheck. When cash was scarce, hop picking was a way to provide necessities. Charles Staley remembers that income from harvesting hops was all he had in the way of cash. If we wanted to go to school and have some clothes and some school books, we picked up by guys. For some people, particularly during the Great Depression, hop picking was a way for a family to eke out an income in bad times. Accommodations at the farms varied. Pickers usually provided their own food and bedding, and sometimes their own tent and camp stove. On the larger farms, the grower provided cabins or tents as well as stoves, firewood, tables, benches, and straw for sleeping mats. Small stores were often available on both the large and smaller farms for the convenience of the pickers. <laughs> 